Hello and welcome to this week's Devil the Detail podcast. I'm Rob Paxson and I'm here talking all things. So for a Devil's Joining the Show this week, as ever, we've got Paul Whiteside. This is three weeks in a row. Uh, Paul, is global warming doing your job and keeping Britain warm? <laughs> it's been a long day. It's late when we're doing it, isn't it? It's been a long day today, but no, it's good that I can get on for, for the third week running. So don't be jinxing it now, though. Don't be jinxing <laughs> it. But no, uh, today's not been too bad. It was a 12-hour day, but I've had me tea and, and got back, so I'm, I'm all right now for a, for a bit until I start nodding off. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, busy week. We had Mother's Day uh, 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 weekend, obviously. Treated uh, me, me wife uh, to a lovely meal. Obviously, you know, we are the family. Uh, do you do anything special for Helen? Um, on Sunday? Let me think hmm. now. We did a weekend. I can't remember now. Oh, Sunday we went to see my mum. We went to my mum's and uh, my mum did a bit of tea for us all and um, Aloise came, well, well Aloise lives there, don't she? But she was there and, and my niece was there and that was good. It was good. We had a, had a nice bite to eat and that. And uh, What else did we do at weekend? Saturday, Saturday, what did we do Saturday? Uh, I was working Saturday, that's what. <laughs> I was working Saturday and it was a bit, uh, I was a bit blurry. I had Saturday at work. I was over in Liverpool and there was nothing off on the way home because it was a bit of a bit of a late night on Friday night. But, uh, but yeah, Sunday was a good day with the family and that. Yeah, and also Paul Rowley's birthday today. So happy birthday to uh, Paul Rowley from everyone on the podcast. Um, obviously, you know, doing a great job for us. He's given happiness to lots of Reds in the last 12 months. So hopefully he's having a, a happy day today. Yeah, yeah, oh, I didn't know it was his birthday. Yeah, happy birthday, Paul. Yeah, um, not sure how old he is, actually. He's, 49. He's 49. Yeah, I was going to say, because he, he said he was five. I think the last time Salford won at Saints, yes, it'd be 45, wouldn't he? Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, big one next year for him then. Yeah, hopefully a big day, big year this year as well mm. for us. Three weird, three wins on the spin. Uh, exciting times. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, I think the, the the win at Saint Helens might have taken a bit, taken a bit out of us because it was a bruising encounter. But um, but no, it was great to to get three wins on the trot. I mean, six points, joint top, aren't we at the table? So it's a great start to the season. Mm. So what we'll do, we'll look back at all the games this week, all the big news coming out of the club and in uh, rugby league, uh, and then we'll preview uh, this week's game. So we'll start with the uh, famous win against Saint Helens. So, so for the Devils were victorious. The first time in 44 years, Paul, the so Southern Devils have beaten St. Helens at St. Helens. They won 24 points to 20. What a fantastic win. Yeah, it was. It was a great performance, in the, especially in the second half. I thought in the first half, we, I remember saying to my dad after about 10 or 15 minutes, I said, oh God, they look too strong for us. They look too strong, too powerful. And it was a bit like men against boys. They were sort of bashing us off the tackles and... I, I did have a bit of a fear, really. When they went 8-0 up, I thought, you know, we, we could be in for a bit of a towel in here, to be honest with you. But uh, but we hung in there. We eventually got a bit of pressure. And I think the kicking from Mark Sneed, you know, it, it caught them in two minds a few times and they, they let the ball bounce. And it was one of them kicks where we got the ball back and um, eventually got a bit of pressure on the line and then got a try. And once we had got that try, I thought, we looked, we looked pretty good then. But then, for me, we let St. Helens offload the ball quite a lot. Uh, we weren't clamping the ball in the tackle and that third try what Percival scored I thought it was poor defending really that and he just run a straight line and, and went over and scored so at 14 points to 6 at half time I thought we were just about hanging on in there I mean Saints are a good side aren't they but we'd, we'd worked out in that first half yeah obviously a quick just quick run through the timeline like you said Saints open the scoring Wellsby out wide cut us open from a, from a scrum he scored in the corner. Louis Stodd made it 8-0, bursts down the middle. But yeah. then we hit back, try from Dion Cross, lovely work by Mark Sneed and Ryan Briley, sent Cross over for his first try of the game. Yeah, he, he finished well, Dion Cross. He played really well in that game and, uh, you know, took his chances well. You know, he's a St. Helens lad, isn't he? So going back to his old town there and, and scoring, you know, but he, was, he was chuffed with that. But no, I was quite pleased with the first half. I thought we were a bit unlucky to be 14 points to six, uh, six behind, really, because we've worked hard. I had a lot of defending to do again, like we did against OKR in that first half there. But no, going in at half time, I was quietly confident we could come back in the second half. But 40 points, six down at St. Helens, you, you do start to think, is it going to be another another year goes by? But no, it, it wasn't. There was plenty of incident and, and that happened in the second half. Mm. Yeah, like you said, just for half time, Percival goes over to make it 14 6. Half time, come, half time comes and goes, and then Saints get. Reduced as well. Men Percival sent off uh, for a tackle on Armand Roy. What did you make of it? Did you think it was a sending off offence? 
when I first started watching rugby league, Rob, that's not a red card, but <laughs> it is now. It is now. Um, do you know what? At the start of the season, the people went round to the clubs, the RFL, didn't they, and spoke to the clubs, they briefed the clubs about this. So St. Helens are not behind the door. For a professional club, Matt Purcell wasn't playing the game long enough to know that you can't do that. So what, what he did there to me, he didn't he make no attempt to do a tackle, really. He didn't even put his arms around him. It was reckless. And you know, I said on my batch report, I wouldn't have shown him a red card for that because I like it tough and strong. And Jack Armand's a tough lad. But I think what you've got to remember is if that had been Jack Armand on Matt Percival, the St. Helens supporters and it would have been going mad for a red card. So you, you, oh, I'd say it was King Runny Eye, it had been a red card all day. So I just think it was a silly thing to do from Percival. He'd already knocked the ball on Jack Armand, right? So it, it, it just it just it didn't look good, did it? So when things don't look good and they're a bit reckless like that, you, you, you're going down a, a fine line there, really. So I don't think you'd have any complaints with that. Yeah. Personally, I thought, well, I thought it was a tough challenge, like you said. But what I remember, what I look back on is the Chris Atkin uh, yellow card at Leeds, um, yeah. where the Leeds player tackled Chris Atkin and collapsed in the tackle, which made it look like a, I don't think it, it was much of a yellow card. This one um, with um, Wellsby, he jumps, not Wellsby, uh, yeah. Percival, he jumps up in the challenge, doesn't he? Yeah. And, and hits Almondroid on the way up. So it looks more aggressive. I think there's more intent in it. So I think that's why it's a red card. Is it a dangerous challenge? I'd probably say yes, because it, it rocks Almondroid back. But it, but obviously with the new rules, that's what that's the most important thing. Is there intent? Yeah. Is a collision with the head? Yeah. So it's a red card. Yeah, like I said, Percival's, he's been in their, their, their team for, for donkey's years, hasn't he? He knows the game inside out. And for someone like him, it's a bit of a naive challenge to come up with, really. He mm. should know better. Um, I'm not saying that... I, I like stuff like that in the game. I enjoy the physicalities of rugby league. But if we're all playing to a set of rules, you've got to behave yourself, haven't you, and, and, mm. and do the right thing. And that, that to me, was un, wasn't was needed. He didn't need to do that, really. So And it was it was aggressive, and it was... It was sort of a show of aggression, wasn't it? You can see yeah. him throw, throw the marker down here, Ormond Road. You have that. And if you're going to do that, this this season, it's not going to be tolerated. And it won't be next season either. So so I don't think you have any complaints, really. Yeah. So, Saints without a 12 men, um, we smell smell an opportunity uh, that it could be a you know a moment for us. Unfortunately, though, Saints scored next. Try for Lewis Dodd. Cut through to make it. Well, 18-6. Then he kicked a goal to make it 26. And for me, at that point, Saints obviously were down to 12 men. And they had a feel and they knew that one more try, that would win it for them. And we knew they were down to 12 men. So we have, we had to make something happen at that point. And it was really intriguing <coughs> that both sides were in a kind of panic mode trying to get that crucial score. Yeah, well, it was a bit disappointing, really, because what led to the... The, the try, the Dodd try, um, we, we got pulled back for a, I think it was for a forward pass when the ball yeah. went out wide and Ryan Briley was going mad at the, the, the touch judge and uh, I think it was a touch judge you gave it actually. Or was it obstruction he gave? I think it was either a forward, no, it was a forward pass and it was never a forward pass. It was a really poor decision, I thought. And uh, and yeah, we didn't defend that and, and Saints went over and I thought to myself when they scored that try and went 20 points to six up, I thought I can't see us. I can't see us winning this now. I thought we were too far behind, but uh, shows what I know, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, obviously, like you said, it was it was a crucial moment there. Uh, three moments really, like you said, the the Bradley forward pass, the Hankinson got sort of dumped into touch, and Neil McDonald kind of went sort of went round the outside, kicked the ball dead, and at that point for up for me. We were in panic mode there because we were like, we have to score on this next sector to get in the game. Saints knew that. And, you know, we talk about gamesmanship. We talk about the top teams knowing how to win. And I think it was a perfect example of what top teams do. Because obviously, let's just rewind a bit where the um, St. Ellen's just for, I think it was half time, where Wormsley obstructs Ryan Briley as he goes for the ball. And they give it as a dropout. Warms, he stays down. Okay. Then he gets a bit of treatment, then leaves the pitch. So they can't put him in the bin for obstruction because he's off. He's going off being substituted. So it's the moments like that where you think it's clever. It's not, they're yeah. not breaking any rules. They're just a top team 
bending the rules as much as they can. Like the fact when we were down to 12 men, well, they were down to 12 men. They, they brought the crowd into it. They were punching in the air, they're high-fiving, they were shoving sort of players around, trying to get a reaction to try and stir everyone up. And I think that's obviously top teams, either they'll, they'll play well and win or they'll they'll scrape out and win. So I think it's an example for how a top team can manufacture a result when they need to. Yeah, yeah, you, you did, right? And um, yeah, that, that warms the one in the first half. I was right near that. And it, it looked like he sort of tripped him there. But I've seen the replay. And when you watch the replay, he's sort of out of shot, so you can't really see it. But it did look a bit a bit dodgy. And the crowd were going mad. And the players were, were upset mm. about that as well. And, and like you said, Wormsley went off there and took, took the sting out. Because I remember thinking that at the time. But no, you know, good sides do that, don't they? They'll do anything to try and get an edge, won't they? And um, I think that goes on in all sports, doesn't it? So, Saints are out of 12 men. They're riving everyone up, crowds up to try and panic us into make a decision. Um, I'm not, I don't, I don't know whether it was Paul Rowley, I don't know whether it was Mark Sneed, or whether it was somebody else somewhere decided that we don't have to score on this next set. We know the spaces, so we just let's not panic and let's just play our natural game, which is attacking an edge, find a space, and the way obviously Percival where Percival would have been in the line, there's gaps. So, from that point on, which was 59 minutes, we were in total control because we didn't panic. And that shows, for me, how far this team has come. Because we've watched Salford for years, haven't we? And I've seen us in that situation, bomb, bomb chances, and then they'll go and score, and that'll be that. So, this team managed to hold it all together and, and get the result in the end, which is, which is you know, full praise to Paul Round, the player, for doing that. Yeah, he is. I mean, they didn't have long to go there either. You're only talking like 20 minutes to, to mm. score three tries. And, you know, Saints were defending really frantic. So you've got to pick and choose your moments, haven't you? And pick and choose your chances. And, you know, it'd be easy to, to sort of toss it away there. And like you said, try and score in every play. Well, they didn't. They picked, they picked the plays, didn't they, really? And, you know, I spoke to Paul Rowley after the game. He said he was quietly confident. They got the message out not to panic and, 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 the, and the chances will come. And, and they did do. Yeah. So, Salford's comeback started with Neem McDonald. Uh, lovely ball to him. Crash ball. Crashed over the line. No one stopping him from that close. And momentum built from there. Yeah, it did. Yeah, it, it was a good finish that from, from Neem McDonald. And uh, and we needed that as well, didn't we? So, uh, so yeah, and he, he's been in good form, hasn't he? Making a lot of metres as well. And, and, and that was a, a good finish. Yeah. Salford scored again. Chris Atkin came across the line. Nothing on. Went back the same. Went back the other way. Found a gap. Went over by the post. And the wheels were starting to turn. They were, yeah. Chris Atkin did really well there. It looked like there was nothing on. He sort of went down a blind alley and um, it, it just opened up there like the Red Sea for him, didn't it? And, <laughs> and he finished that really well. And I was pleased for Chris Atkin. You know, he took a lot of hammer against St. Helens in the last couple of times we've been there. So it was good to, to see him get over. And just on the back of that, he stepped in for Kay Cust, who went off in the first half. And uh, from what I've, I've heard, I mean, I think Kay Cust got a bit of a head knock in a bit of a suspect challenge as well that's sort of uh, gone under the radar so uh, he's going to miss next week isn't he but you know Chris Atkin ever willing as he always is dead reliable came and did a great job for us yeah so then the big moment came six minutes to go lovely move from right to left Mark Sneed involved he gives it to Tim Laffey who steps out of one challenge wonderful offload to Dion Cross who rides off one defender and crashes over and sends his whole fans into ecstasy Oh, it was a great pass from, from Tim Laffey, wasn't it? I mean, I've seen the, the replay of it a couple of times now. <laughs> it's a great, great bottle and um, what a great way to, to, to finish the match. I mean, the crowd behind the sticks were going absolutely mental and it was it was like we won the grand final. You know, it was really, really, <laughs> you're not seeing celebrations like that for a long time, but no, a great way to finish a match. Real, real quality try that and well done to Dion Cross for, for getting over. Yeah, obviously, Saints came late, nearly won it in the end, Wormsley going for the line, but Salford players threw the bodies on the line, managed to uh, keep the big Saint out. Obviously, like you say, wonderful moment. Uh, everybody really excited behind the post on the field. Real moment for everybody to celebrate the first win against Allen in 44 years. Yeah, well, well, I saw Wormsley come back on. He'd not played much of the, the game since he went off in the first half. He'd come back on towards the end there. I could see him sort of limbering up to take that run. And I looked at my dad and went, he's going to score him here, isn't he? 
big Wormsley. And he come charging onto the ball. And I think it was um, it was Shorrix and Burr, I think, who hit him. And it was a it was a great tackle to dislodge the ball. And then Sam Stone ruffled his hair and um, <laughs> and that was that. And, and and I was really pleased because St. Helens are the sort of team that do that to people, don't they? And sort of wind the opposition up. But the, it was us. I thought I thought our game management and um, sort of professionalism and defence and detail in defence was, was great. And um, yeah, I mean, the game wasn't quite over there when they, when Warms had lost the ball because it was still like, I think the Saints got the ball back one more time. They finished with possession, didn't they? But um, you just had a feeling that they were going to do what they normally do, you know, and get one of them, get like one of them crazy tries that they normally get. But no, credit to the, the Southland defence. It was uh, tremendous all night. Yeah, I think Callum Watkins was involved as well as well in that. Yeah. Like you said, Stam Stone, but it's it's bodies on the bodies on your line time in it, and yeah, you know, we we you know we talk about Saints, you know, they never know when they're beaten. They'll always go to the very end. And for me, obviously, you know, we look back at all the the players that have played for Saints in the past, like so James Roby, um, you know, Tommy Matt, Tommy Martin, Sean Long, um. These players, when big moments happen, they produce something. And yeah. for me, that moment there, where's Lewis Dodd? Where's Lomax? You know what I mean? I know you have to warm the takes some responsibility and fair to play to him because he, he rampages to the line and it's desperate defence that stops him. But is this is that a sign that, you know, they're not as good as they used to be? In this situation where big moments happen, they're just not able to to finish it. Or is it just a a wanna? Well, I think when they had the likes of Sean Long and Tommy Martin playing, they, used, they still used to lose games, didn't they? They just never lost any games to us. But um, <laughs> I think it, it was just one of them nights, wasn't it? I mean, you can't expect to win every single game every time you play a certain club. And I think the, the forty odd years of us going to St. Helens, we've got a lot closer. I mean. When we used to go to, to Knowsley Road, certainly in the years I've watched us, we never really got that close. You know, once or twice we would come close, but we usually got a good hiding. But since they've moved to the new stadium, we've had a lot of close games there. We've come close on a, few, a number of occasions. I can think of three or four where we've probably probably come up with the you know rough end of the stick or a bit of a bit of a decision that's gone against us. And you know, on on Friday night, I wouldn't say this, we got loads of decisions, but. You know, the red card sort of played into our hands a little bit, but that's not really our fault. There's nothing to do with us, really. It's up to their players, isn't it? But we took our chances as well. But I think you've got to credit our defence. I think our defence was amazing. And you saw, the Saints can sort of blame the referee and say, you know, we sent somebody off. But what they'll have to remember is they scored a try when they were down to 12 men and had a 20 points to six lead. So um, I think you've got to give Salford a lot of credit for the resilience and the defence, you know, we put in on the yeah. show. And I think they were brave as well. Mm-hmm. Obviously, when history beckons, it's a moment to stand up in it. And I think Paul Rowley often talks about um, rugby players, players who, who know the game and can play the game and not just players who, who are big and pick a ball up and run. And I think that helped um, on uh, against Saints because the players knew what the situation was and they played to the plan in the last 20 minutes. And, yeah. and that's full, full credit to Paul Rowley, full credit to the players for, for getting the job done. Well, they had to do. I mean, the, the, the sort of uh, back end of the, the second half, we were playing without any middles, really. I mean, Singleton had gone off. He, he, he bashed his knee when he returned that, um, that, that I think it was a penalty or a, or a dropout. He returned and he, he clashed his knee. He came in like a steam train, and that's when he did his injury. So he'd gone off. Jack Armand had gone off. King Bunny Iowa had gone off. So you're playing the last sort of 15, 20 minutes without any pr- recognised props, really. So that's where you like to Joe Shorrock stood up. Thought he was he was tremendous. Ben Elliwell came on and did, did did a great shift for us. Well, Amir Burrow was, was really, really good. Shane Wright, Sam Stone getting back to the best. Callum Watkins, I thought, was tremendous all night, really, and really led by example. And, you know, you forget sometimes that he's on the pitch because, uh, you know, you just expect him to play well, don't you? But uh, I thought all the players were uh, were tremendous. You know, Hankins yep. out wide and Dion Cross. Really, really good. Yeah. Obviously, looking at the stats, uh, team stats, um, possession, we had 51% possession. They had 49% possession. Uh, Tackles, we made 295 tackles. They made 223 tackles. Our completion, we ran at 93%, which is fantastic. They went at 84. Um, Completed sets, we went at 31. They were at 28. 
carries was 198. They had 165 meters. Uh, we made 1,069. They made 1,088. Tackle burst. This is this is interesting. This one, uh, Paul. We made 33, and they made 19. Hmm. Well, it just Which I is... think it just just shows you there, doesn't it? Our defense stood up and was counting because, like I said to you before, in that first half. I was worried because I thought they, they're just swatting us off here. Like the, the, the sheer size of them, they, they look totally different, look, so much stronger than our players and bigger. And, and, I, and I feared for us there. But I think we, we muscled up in defence and, and, and really worked hard and we weren't busted at all. We got busted a bit down that middle in the first half, but the second half I thought it was great. We really saw it up. And yeah, we, you're playing against 12 men, aren't you? But you're playing against 12 good men, some 12 good players, aren't you? And, mm. you know, the way we've been predicted to finish near the bottom of the table, you know, having a man, a man advantage there, you still back Satan to probably beat Salt, wouldn't you? He's a betting man, but I, I thought it was tremendous and tremendously brave as well. Yeah, uh, missed tackles. Um, we had 19, they had 33. Errors, we made 10, they made 12. Obviously, last week we talked, we, we had the stats that we made, I think it was triple that last, yeah. last week. So it shows, obviously, they've worked on it and. Obviously, against Seattle, Lunds, who are a top team, uh, to only miss 19 um, is, a, is a good result. Yeah, I think the discipline was good as well. We weren't getting pinged for offside all the time. I think there's a few in the first half, but I don't think we was, we was overly bashed with penalties and that were we in the game. So that, that sort of was good. But you, you nailed it there with the completion rate. I mean, if you're completing 93%, that sort of says you're not making many mistakes. You're getting through your sets. You're not giving knock-ons away, forward passes. You know you're not getting penalised. So, you know if you can complete in 93 percent every week, you'll win. you win a lot more games than you lose. Mm. Uh, looking at the stats, personal stats. This one, uh, top tacklers Tim Lafay with 16, Mark Sneed with 23, Amir Butter with 34, King V with 29, Stam Stone with 40, Callum Watkins with 23, Joe Shorrocks with 36, and Ben Helliwell with 25. Yeah, I thought Joe Shorrocks was absolutely outstanding. I really did. He played above his weight all the game. He's not the biggest of blokes, is he? I need to apologise to him as well. I called him Oliver Parton's. <laughs> report. And I keep getting him mixed up with them. So we talk to my dad about him and I'll, I'll call you know, one of them by the different name. I think it's due to the, the hairstyles that they used to have when they played for Wigan. I, I sort of get them mixed up, but you know, I thought um, I thought Shorrocks was really, really good. I thought he was, you know, he, he's he's not flash, is he? But he just does all the hard work, and, and he's a very, very useful player as well. I think we've signed a top, top player in here, and and yeah, Helliwell came on and did a good shift as well. And but all the substitutes came on and did a job. I thought everybody worked hard, everybody did the job. And, and I said the same thing when we played OK. If you've got 17 players who are going to play well and do the job, you, you've got a chance of beating anybody. Yeah. Um, top meter makers. Need McDonald, 145. Tim Lafay, 146. Dion Cross, 112. Um, Chris Hankinson, 100, 100. So they're the backs. Um Forward, Sam Stone, 52. Callum Watkins, 74. Shane Wright, 44. And Shorrix, 45. Yeah, the backs, you know, making a lot of metres there. I thought Ankinson was, was really good again. Uh, Dion Cross, you know, scoring a few tries as well now, wasn't he? Uh, you know, took his chances really, really well. Tim Lafay was back to his best, really, wasn't he? He was really dangerous all night, I thought. He was against Um, You know, I, I thought he started the season pretty quiet. You know, against Leeds, but he's really come to the fore. I thought he was good against OK. He was dead hard to tackle, and he was good in that Saints game. They didn't, they didn't know how to um, how to handle him sometimes when he was running and offloading the ball. And and, uh, and yeah, we, we look good. We look good in possession. I think Paul Wellen said that after the game. You know about we don't know what sort of shape Salford are going to throw at us. And I think teams are wary of us the way we play because I think we're really hard to defend against and to score twenty four points at Saint. I mean, they only conceded eight points all season in three matches, so. Um, and all this mitigation there with it being down to 12 men, but still, it's no mean feat to get 24 points there. Yeah, and Ben Hellowell with 58. Forgot about Ben on a different, in a different uh, place on the page. But he, he did make 58 metres, which, which is great for him. Uh, average gain, um, Tim Lafay, 9. Brad Signalton, 8. Neil McDonald, 7. Dion Cross, 7. Uh, Hellowell, 7. And most of them, 7 and below. So we always say seven and above, which which is good, and it shows, like you say, we're making meters in the tackle. 
Yeah, I thought Singleton had a good game. I thought Brad Singleton was really good again. He's he's no nonsense, and uh, yeah, he, he, I spoke to him after the game. He, he got a bang on his knee, and he had like a bit of a strapping on there. And uh, well, it wasn't just a little strapping; it was quite a big thing because I sort of said to him, "Wow, what have you done?" And um, yeah, he, I think he was having a scan this week, so I don't think he's in the squad as if for, uh, for Thursday night. I don't think he's anyway. So hopefully he'll be back soon because he'll be a big miss and. When you're down in numbers anyway, because Kay Cust will be out as well this week. One of their assessment, we're, uh, we're running a bit low on numbers, aren't we? But no, I thought all the forwards put a shift in. I thought every player put a shift in. And uh, they can be proud of their efforts. You know, they, it was heroic, really. It really was a top one. Win. Yeah. So big thanks for your three word match reports of Man of the Matches. Luke OD, never in doubt. Dion Cross. Mark stuck in there. Shorrox. Dave Wallen, never say die, everybody. Dave Parker, never say die. Sneed. Andy Smith, can't, I can't speak, all 17. Anita, never in doubt, Sneed. Parker, at long last, Shorrox. Colin Wilson, one immense evening, Shorrox. You said, never stop believing, Partington, A.K. Shorrox. <laughs> uh, Andy Lancashire, laugh eyes, magic hands, Sneed. Natalie Taylor, salty Saints losers, laugh eye. Uh, your mate, Royal Abbey, he's still um, shaking, laugh eye. OSF, about flipping time, Shorrox, uh, David Deacon, I was dreaming, all of them. Um, Chris71, well done, lads. Uh, Dave H, never write off Sneed. Uh, and that's it. So, obviously, joyous scenes behind the behind the post joyous scenes from everyone obviously 40 year 44 years we've waited for for a win like that uh paul uh, and i think it's probably the, the only ground well there's no ground now we haven't won at yeah yeah no it was good i mean dad was chuffed on the way home he was saying to me and our image and he was 21 last time he won there and he <laughs> married in the september so he's been married all these years and he's never won again at st Helen. so and um, so yeah it was it was good it, it was great you know it was supporters we, we started it was heartwarming to see because, you know, you, you come away from the game sometimes and you think, blimey, you know, set on supporters, Wigan supporters, they, they spoil it really, aren't they? They see a lot of success and, you know, we don't. And, and when we get good nights like that, it makes up for all the times you've been to St. Helens and been absolutely battered and you've, you've come home and they've been laughing at you to support us. And, you know, for once it was our night and, you know, we don't get many of them against the top side. So, uh, so really, really enjoyed it. And, um, and yeah, it's, a, it's been a great start to the season, Rob. You know, three wins out of four. And we could have won at Leeds as well. You know, we weren't far off in that game. So, you know, considering everyone's writing us off and we're 101 to win the grand final, we're not we're not doing too bad. So, uh, so no, I think Paul Rowley's got a real good work ethic there and we, we're playing some good stuff. And, you know, we're not going to make rash predictions and say what we're going to do. I think I think everybody's like that. The club, the supporters are the same, aren't they? We, we just take each game as it comes and, and see where it takes us. Yep. So, let's move on now to our ladies. They were in action uh, this week. They played Lee at Twist Lane. And Lee went down to defeat 40 points to nil. Uh, again, terrible conditions with rain and wind and mud. Um, last week, we talked about the defence. I thought this week, Paul, defence was, was fantastic. Um, considering the amount of pressure they were under, uh, Lee, good side, kept the ball moving, had big forwards rolling forward. and. We asked, obviously, Parky talked about hitting and sticking, and I think they did that against Lee. I thought the defence, even though they lost forty nil, um, you know, the, the, you know, from one to seventeen, they, they gave everything. Well, that's all you can ask for. Uh, that's all we've ever asked for. You know, when we watched the men's team over the years, and you know, if you get beat, you get beat, don't you? Sometimes you do, don't you? You'll come up against better opposition than you, and no matter how hard you try, and no matter what you do, you're not going to win the game because they're better than you. And uh, we've had years of that where we used to go to games not expecting to win and just expecting to keep the score down. So, you know, we, we know all about that. But, you know, like we said last week, it's a new team. You know, Lee are a good side, aren't they? And, um, you know, all you can ask is they used to go out and do the best. And um, sometimes you need a bit of luck, don't you? And it, sometimes it takes a few defeats and getting things right to, to get you on, on the on the right sort of path to, to start winning games. So, um, so yeah, you've not got to be too down at it about it. You've just got to keep going and eventually your luck will turn and your form will turn. Yeah, I think the problem they've got, Paul, is the fact that the completion rate isn't the greatest. I think they turned over a lot of ball. I know uh, Mike Grady 
last week um, said they were completing it at 25%. I don't think that the completion rate was, was even that well. I think, but unfortunately, if you're conceding possession and you're conceding territory, you're absorbing all the time. And, and that's what happened, I think, in this situation. Well, yeah, if, you, if your completion rate is 25%, you're not getting through your tackle. So, to me, you're not having any ball. You know, possession's king, isn't it? And you've got to treat the ball like it's a precious thing. And if you don't, and you, you've not got the ball, your opposition's got the ball. And when your opposition's got the ball, they're going to score. So, I won't, you know, you've probably not got the stats for that game. But what would the possession be for that game? The possession stats, you're probably talking 70-odd percent to, to, to Lee and, and the rest to solve for that. And you're never going to win any game. Being that because, like you said, you're absorbing, you're doing loads of tackling, you, you're wearing yourself out, and then you can see points, don't you, on the back of that because you make mistakes because you, you're fatigued because you've been concentrating, working out of defending. So, completion rates sometimes we, we look at stats and think a lot of, you know too much of them, but I think completion rates is a massive one because if you're completed, you, you've got the ball, the other team can't score when you've got the ball. So, um, yeah, it's a big one, that yeah. To be fair, though, when we did get in possession. And position, we had chances. Um, Tasca Corran, she gave the ball to Summer Harris, who, who attacked the edge. She gave it to Emily Webb, who nearly went over in the corner. Frantic Lady Friends managed to, to squeeze her out. Uh, Jadine uh, McVernon in, intercepted a ball, ran 50 metres, got caught. Um, Linda Ever Egan, who's a, a sort of a new player, got a Really good offload. Um, got the ball back from Becky Davis, who was playing hooker this week. Um, Egan nearly went over herself. So when Salford had the opportunity in sort of the lead danger zone, we did ask questions. It's just getting up there. That's the problem. And keeping the ball. Yeah, keeping the ball. Yeah, it's about keeping the ball and then building that pressure, isn't it? Then. And, if you can keep the ball, build the pressure, that's when teams teams crumble, don't they? And, uh, and teams will start conceding points. So, so yeah, I think it's, it's a tricky one, but Rome wasn't built in a day, as they say, and you've got, you've got to take small steps and, and get things right. And it's no use trying to run before you can walk. I know I'm coming up with all these conundrums here, but it, it's true in rugby league. Get back to basics now. Get that completion rate set and... No, I think you want to go into every game and win, but you want to go into every game and improve. When you've been beaten 40-0, the best thing you do the week after is, is improve your performance and then see where that takes you. Yeah. So, obviously, you know, 40-0 defeat on the scoreboard looks like we got hammered. But, like you said before, like we said before, effort and commitment was there. It's like you say, if you turn it over the ball, you can absorb, and that's and that's what's happened, especially in them conditions, obviously, with the rain and mud. It seems that every time the ladies play, somebody does a little rain dance, uh, you know, 24 hours before, and they have to play on a mud bath. Could do with somebody doing a bit of a sun dance on a Saturday against Wigan. Well, yeah, you need summer rugby to turn up, don't you? I mean, I saw the highlights of Halifax, not Halifax, sorry, Featherstone, Wakefield, the weekend in the Challenge Cup, and it, that was like an old-school mud bath. But that's what mm. rugby league used to be like, you know, before the summer era, wasn't it? Every week was like that, wasn't it? Playing in the mud and the rain and the snow and whatever. So, uh, so yeah, I don't know what the weather's going to be like this weekend, Rob, but we could do with a bit more drier weather, couldn't we, and that for uh, for the ladies in the, in the sake of uh, the pictures and that. So, uh, let's hope we get a bit of dry weather. Yeah. Um, our reserves were in action against St. Helens. Went down to defeat 64 points to 16. We talked last week, didn't we, about, you know, development and St. Helens are a very good team. Um, you know, very good club. Got some good youngsters coming through. And it was obviously a big test for Stuart Wilkerson's uh, boys. Obviously coming down to defeat, you know, isn't the be-all and end-all. It's all about developing and I'm sure they'll have taken lots from the game. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you can look at that St. Allen side and, and there's probably players in there who could walk into a lot of Super League teams as well. And you look at St. Allen's, if they've got lads coming through, you know, they're, they're always ready when they come through. They'll bring lads in on the bench or whatever and, they, and those guys are ready to play because that's that's the way the conveyor belt works at St. Allen's. So, um, so, no, it's no mean feat that going down to them. They're, they're, they're a well-schooled side. We saw that in that friendly game, didn't we? And they, were, they were absolutely magic. So, uh, so yeah, it's just... Uh, I think with the, with the reserves and that, yeah, you want to win matches, but you want to develop players, don't you? I think the developing the players and getting players better is is the is the main thing. So um, you know, the, again, it's a new side. This all from Brazil. There's a lot of new players coming to that, so that takes time as well. So as long as those guys are improving 
and you know uh, getting better week in week out they'll they'll learn so much from the matches that they're playing and and uh, get themselves hardened up and you know I think they'll see some good results as the season progresses. Yep, uh, our wheelchair team was in action as well this weekend. They played Halifax at Eccles. Unfortunately, went down to defeat. 32 points to 16. Uh, a crowd as well uh, turned up. Uh, a few pictures and videos on Twitter uh, on a, on a, on the benches on the side. Uh, it's great. Obviously, wheelchair rugby is is becoming more popular, and it's great that we've got a, a team to represent the club. Yeah, it certainly is. Yeah, I mean, pretty close game that really wasn't it. So, like you said, a lot of people interested there and uh, a good crowd for it. And it's just it's a sport that's growing all the time. And now we've got a club as well. I think our supporter base for it or for that section of our club will, will grow as well because it's it's exciting wheelchair rugby. There's no doubt about that. I think more and more people are going to get involved. So, I think as the season goes on this year, that that'll grow arms and legs and get better and better. Um, tries were from Marissa Chaplin, uh, Mark Riley, and Dave Abel. Dave Abel kicked two goals as well. So, you know, like you say, defeat, but worked hard, and that and that's all all that matters really. Obviously, they've got more f- games to come, which we, which we'll come on to uh, later in the show. So, exciting times for, for wheelchair rugby. Exciting times for Salford. Yeah, it certainly is. It's great that we're represented now in in all these different departments and. Uh, you know, it's great for us to chat about the other teams as well, isn't it? Rather than just the first team. I know the first team played well this week and you know, we want to talk about but some weeks when they've got beat and that it's nice to chat about the other teams as well. So uh, no, I think it's great that we've got we've got all the bases covered now. Yeah. So that's all the action and now we'll see what's happening in the news. So we'll start with the Challenge Cup. Salford would drew away from home against Hull Kingston Rovers. A repeat of our Challenge Cup tie. Last season, where we departed the competition, will be a difficult tie for Paul Rowley's men. Yeah, it will be. It's always a difficult ground to go to. And we've not got the best record there, have we? Really? We've had, we had some good results at OKI in the past, but we've had a lot of defeats there as well. You know, I think we beat them there twice last season, twice the year before, I think, as well. So, so yeah, it's going to be a tough place to go. Um, last 16, I watched the draw. A bit of an anti-climax, really, when your team gets drawn out through. We second team out, weren't we? So, a uh, bit of an anti-climax. But it wasn't the draw I was hoping for, but... I mean, you don't get much worse than that. You could have got Catalans away, I suppose, couldn't you? But okay, that's probably the furthest trip on a Friday night as well. So, uh, so yeah, that's going to have to be um, an early dart from work, I think, it's straight there in the van. But no, you've got you've got to beat someone decent if you want to get to the final. And um, you would be okay at once early this season. It'll be a close game. I think they're, they're quite a similar side to us, aren't they? Similar abilities to us. So, uh, should be a good game. Yeah, I just hope that obviously last season's defeat, our season kind of tailed off yeah. after it really I'm just hoping that we learn from that experience uh, both players and Paul Rowley whatever happens continue to be focused on the league uh, whatever the result obviously Challenge Cup is important you know a real opportunity to win silverware um, but it's not the be on and do you make sure we, we finish as high as we can in the Super League uh, to be consistent for these people who don't go every week watch us on the tele see league tables in uh, newspapers are on TV and we need to be up com- competing for them to realise what good team we are. Yeah, it's funny really. I mean, if somebody said to you that you can finish bottom of the Super League and, and win the Challenge Cup, I don't know. I think <laughs> I'd be like quite tempted to say, yeah, I'll have the Challenge Cup. But I know exactly what you mean. I think this season, it's a different stage. You played okay in the last eight last season. It was a bit, it was sort of May time when we, we got beat there. And I think... If you noticed round about that time when we lost away at St. Helens and Shane Wright got injured and we had quite a few injuries, didn't we, to players and, and the season just seemed to, to nosedive a bit then, didn't it? But prior to that, we were doing really well. We had a good run. We beat Huddersfield in the Cup at, at Salford in that, that exciting game. So, um, so yeah, it's a bit earlier in the season this time. So but we were going there on the back of, well, three tough games. We played OKR, um, the Saints and Wigan game this week, and then go in there. So we, we could be battering and bruised going there next uh, next Friday. So it's gonna be it's gonna be tough. Whatever happens, you know they're they're gonna be uh, be wanting to beat us after after losing to us at Salford, aren't they, as well? And like you said, it's there's only two trophies to win in rugby league. So the Challenge Cup is uh, it's a big thing, isn't it? It is. Other ties: um, Wigan are at home to Sheffield Eagles. Batley at home to Casper Tigers, Lee at home to Featherstone, Leeds at home to St. Helens, Warrington at home to London Broncos, Huddersfield at home to Hull, Halifax Panthers at home to Catalan Dragons. What stand, What tie stands out for you there, uh, Paul? I think 
Batley v Castleford with Batley at home with that ill. That'll mm. be, uh, you know, in the second half, if Batley play second half, play down the hill on a second half, it'll be, that'll be interesting. Um, but yeah, some real good games, Leeds and Saints as well. Yeah, I think that's the televised game, isn't it? Leeds and Saints. Well, you would have thought to. They're two of the big hitters, aren't they? They're two of the biggest names in the in the sport, the biggest sort of money and that. And a lot of tradition in the Cup as well. They've, they've met each other in the final a few times, haven't they, over the years? So that should be a good game. Like you said, Batley against Cass, you know, as a romantic, you, you'd want Batley to do really well. And Cass haven't started the season very well, have they? I mean, I I felt it was sorry with Cass. I've watched the game against Warrington. I thought they played all right. They ended up getting beat in that game. So when they played against us, they didn't look too bad either. So, uh, But if you're losing matches, you, you're down on confidence sometimes, aren't you? So that could be a tricky tie for them. The rest of them, I think you said, um, is it Huddersfield and, uh, and have they got Hull? That's yeah. a close one to call. I think that's a tough one to call. Huddersfield are a bit in and out, aren't they? So uh, I'd expect Catalans to, to beat Halifax and um, you'd expect Wigan to beat Sheffield. That's a, sort of a rerun of the 1998 Challenge Cup final when Sheffield beat well, in that semi and beat Wigan in the final. But obviously they're playing in the, uh, the, the first division now, aren't they? But um, but yeah, there's some good ties in there. It should be, it should be exciting and it's not this weekend, the weekend after, so we've not got a long way to wait. Nope. So that's going to be exciting. Uh, don't forget, the tickets are available for our home games coming up. Wigan, Lee and Castleford. Club get a percentage of the money, which is great. Obviously, if you go into the games, get the tickets early. So, obviously, club can benefit. Yeah, you're best off, aren't you? Yeah, my dad tends to go to the ticket office at Salford after the match and just queues up and gets his for the next away game. And uh, it's just easier doing it that way. I think you can... You can phone them and get them posted out. I've done that a couple of times as well. So you're always worth getting them from Salford, though, because it just helps the club getting it, even though there's a small amount that they get. It's, uh, it's better than not getting anything at all. Mm. Just quickly flip back to the Challenge Cup. Only one tie on the BBC uh, over the Challenge Cup weekend, and that's going to be on the iPlayer. Obviously, we talk a lot about new TV deals, um, one on the BBC, one on the Sportsman. Surely... Surely we should have more games available for people to watch. We talk about every Super League game being on the telly and, you know, trying to tap into markets. Surely the Challenge Cup should be the same. Well, I, I thought that the Leeds and Saints game was on the BBC on Friday night, but is it not on terrestrial telly? Is it just on the iPlayer? Yeah, it's on the iPlayer. Wow. That, that match should be on a Saturday afternoon on Grandstand or whatever they call it. Shouldn't it? That should be the flagship game. I'm disappointed with that. I thought Sky Sports could have Challenge Cup games on, but because they, they, they sometimes do. So I presumed it'd be a, sort of a Sky Sports one on the Friday night, then a game Saturday afternoon, a game Sunday afternoon on the BBC. The BBC now have two, don't they? So that's that's very disappointing. That, that very disappointing. First the Challenge Cup, but you can see people don't treat the Challenge Cup with the respect it deserves. I don't think it's all about the Super League now, isn't it? And, I don't know, it's prime time on the BBC, people love it. Mm. Um, so for a Devils Development Academy, uh, finished top of the table um, last week. Obviously, you know, winning games, playing good rugby. We've seen the videos. I'm all singing, I see the Sulphur Reds of Rise. They always say, the future's bright, the future's red. Uh, and these, these kids are showing it. Done really well. Yeah, I've been following the scores and whatever over the last sort of 12 months and that. And uh, you know, the Ambat report and whatever, and I've been amazed how well they've done. So, you know, done done really, really well. And I think it's another um, feather in the cap of the club. There's a lot of talented players there, you know, from far and wide as well. They're not all just, just local lads, are they? You know, we've got other players that, uh, you know, uh, that play for us as well. So, we've done, done tremendously well, and everybody who's been involved with that has done a great job. And, you know, I think it's, um, you know, like, like we've, we've discussed, we've not got like a Category 1 academy at all for but well, we are getting there, aren't we? We're producing players and got players playing under our banner for our club, and and um, that, that's a great positive step that we're taking. Yeah, they play Warrington in the semi final on Wednesday, which the day you'll be listening to this, probably 2 p.m. kickoff at Caddy Z. So we wish them all the luck in the world there. Um, obviously, win there and through the final. Yeah, yeah, really, really exciting. Yeah, wish them all the best. And, uh, you know, by the time people are listening to this, they might have already played that game. So let's hope they get through. And, uh, yeah, should be an exciting day. It carries out. Yeah, other news. Ryan briley has been uh, announced as our vice captain. Uh, one of our own. Knows what it's all about. Obviously, fan come player. Um, and obviously him being selected vice captain. What a moment for him. Yeah, and he, well, he's one of the leaders on the pitch, isn't he? I thought he had a really good game on um, 
on Friday at St. Helens, he was really steady under the eye ball all night. You know, every time the kick went in the air from that Lewis Dodd, and you know, some of them had snow on them that they come down, and he was safe as houses under all of them. You know, took him really, really well. And he sometimes uh, frightens me a bit the way he returns the ball and chucks the pass all over the show right near his dry line. But you know, he's an exciting player, and um, he's one that we've really took to at Salford in his time. Since he, since he signed for us and we've seen his third season now so uh, I think he's been a really good player for us I think he's a really good character to have around the team uh, really friendly guy very very good on television and media when he does stuff like that I think he's a real good character and I, I think he's been a great appointment you know getting that that job yeah, uh, for our ladies, Tasca Corrin has been announced as the new ladies captain with Alex Simpson and Steph Gray uh, involved in a leadership uh, group, uh, which is also very exciting. Uh, Taz taking over from ex-captain Louis Fellingham. Um, we, are, we all know what Tasca Corrin brings uh, to, to, to the play, you know, around the look, dev, around the rook, devastating. Uh, and, you know, when she, she she did speak to us at the media day and, and told us that she was going to be captain. No one told me, no one told me not to tell anybody. Um, but it is what it is. Now the club have announced it uh, and it's great moving forward. That's what Devil in the Details are all about, Rob. We break the big stories, don't we? The club, <laughs> yeah. so, uh, so yeah, I mean, um, yeah, it's been she's a top player for the visit she and you know deservedly got that. And um, yeah, I think this season's going to be tough. Like you said, they lost a lot of experience in like Louise Fellinger and, and, and a few other players who've, who've moved on. So it's going to take time, but I think she'll do a good job there. And um, I think we'll see some positive uh, results as the season goes on. Yeah, it's when the club say, "Don't mention it, don't announce it." And I was like, "I've already managed it. Five thousand people are all they know." So, <laughs> but anyway, you know, we move on. <laughs> Well, I would say it's more. fantastic, like you say. Uh, you know, good luck to her, good luck to the ladies moving forward. Uh, you know, I'm sure there's, there's good things yeah. to come. So that's all the news, uh, Paul. Uh, and now we'll move on to the big game this weekend. So we'll start with the ladies there in Challenge Cup action uh, this weekend. They face Wigan um, at home. Going to be a tough contest. Obviously, Wigan are a, a top Super League side. Um, the return of Brogan Evans, one of our you know, players of the players of the year last season as well. Uh, it's going to be fascinating to see what happens. Yeah, I was looking at the bookies. I think they got a sixty point start for this game, so it's um, you know the bookies don't fancy us to 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 it. So there, there's your motivation straight away there. So it's going to be tough. There's no doubt about that. Wigan are a well skilled team, aren't they? But you know, you just got to go and attack it, haven't you? And you know, do your best and, and just see where it where it takes them. You know, it's, it's going to be a tough season, isn't it? There's no doubt about that. You're playing against sides who are probably a lot more experienced than what you are, but you just got to go out there and uh, and play your game and the, the result will look after itself. Yeah, our wheelchair team in action. They're away at North West Crusaders. Obviously, you know, tough, uh, you know, place to go. Uh, North West Crusaders, great community club down there with with ladies uh, and now wheelchair. It's you know, it's great. That obviously, we get to to go down there and, and give them a game. Yeah, and a nice part of the world as well, isn't it? Down in North Wales. So, uh, so yeah. I think that I've been an enjoyable game that and uh, another game to get under the belts and see if we can get an improvement on last week and hopefully get that uh, get that victory. Yeah, and Paul Rowley's men there in action on Thursday night at home uh, to Wigan Warriors. Obviously, it's over going into the game in good form. Like you said, though, a few injuries, squad's getting a bit narrower again. Um, it's going to be a tough game. Yeah, well, I, I know it's Paul Rowley had named a 20-man 20, uh, 20 squad, hadn't he? And um, in that 20-man squad, you had Andrew Dixon, who's not featured much. You've got Nafaluma, who's not featured at all. Yeah, Ethan Ryan, who's not featured. Matty Foster, who's not featured. I think Kai Morgan's in there as well. So it's pretty threadbare, that squad. You know, I'm not saying, you know, Ethan Ryan's not an experienced player, but he's not played for Salford yet. So neither is David Nafaluma. So it'll be interesting to see who he goes with. I mean, Chris Atkinson wasn't in the squad, so I presume he's picked up a knock as well. Singleton picked up a knock. So that, that win at St. Helens came at a bit of a cost, really, didn't it? And, you know, it's not as if you've got a, an easier game this this Thursday. You're playing Wigan, the world champions, who were, who were rough and tough, and, and they'll give it to us just as much as St. Helens did. So, uh, so yeah, it'll be a tough game. And, and I know um, Wigan have gone to London at the weekend, put 60 points on them. And I don't think Bev and French are... The other guy, Jai Field, played at the weekend. I think, or Harry Smith, I think they rested quite a few players at the weekend. weekend so they're going to be fresh. I think they must have rested them for us, knowing how good we are. So <laughs> it's, going to be a, it's going to be a tough game. You know what Wigan bring, don't you? We've only beaten twice, I think, at the, uh, since we moved, left the Willows. So it's always a, a tough game against Wigan. 
Question is, where's the game going to be won and lost? Obviously, like you say, a few injuries for us. We need to complete. Obviously, Marks needs in, in good form. No key cost because of his head knock. So, potentially having I mean, to move players around to, to fit uh, the space that he left. Um, Paul Rowley will be looking at that squad, wondering how he's going to get everybody in and firing. Yeah, well, you, you thought Chris Ackney come in, wouldn't you, to, mm. to stand off? Because I thought he did well there at, at the weekend. So he's he's your man. He can move about all over the place, can't he? Um, he the wing situation is going to be interesting to see. We bring him on the wing with Ankins is not in the squad. Um, where's the game going to be won and lost? I think <clears throat> you've got to look at the forwards, haven't you? I mean, we scored some good tries against St. Helens, but that that game was was won for me at times in the middle. You know, by players in the, in the middle of the park, like I said, um, um, Shorrock, I was going to say packed, and again, Shorrock's in, um, in, in Halliwell in the middle there in the second half, and the first half, that's a Brad Singleton, Jack Armour, I put a real big shift in. So you're probably looking at that against Wigan because Wigan's got a massive pack. I think their pack's even bigger than St. Helens. They've got some real big players in there. They've signed really well as well, haven't they? Brought people in. I mean, look at like Sir Tyler Dupree. He struggles to get in the team, yet he's probably walking any other side, wouldn't they? So, uh, and they've got a lot of pace on the edges where you look at Liam Marshall, the lightning quick, aren't they? And, uh, you know, Wardle on the, in the centres as well. And then you've got Jai Field, Bevan French. These guys are, are electric, aren't they, once they get going. So they've got strike players everywhere, Rob, you know, Wigan. And um, they're going to take some stopping this season. You know, I think they're mm-hmm. going, to, uh, going to be up there, there about about. So look at the way they played against Penrith. That was a pulsating game. All right, there's a bit of controversy in it, but not many sides would take Penrith like that and, um, and, and do a job on them. So... Yeah, if we win on, on Thursday, does that make us world champions? Yes. Winner stays, winner, stays, winner stays on now, isn't it? So, uh, <laughs> no, it's going to be tough. It's going to be a really, really tough game. Book is give us a 10-point start. So, I um, don't know. How, the way we're playing at the moment, we, we're showing a lot of grit and determination. We've played four games and, and we've not been overawed in any of them. We, we should have beat Leeds and we've won the other three. So, I'm confident we'll, we've got the character and um, and the desire to go out there and uh, and... and you know, compete with Wigan. Yeah, and that's what that's what it's all about. Competing is is the most important thing, especially like you say, only twenty man squad. Everyone is val is valuable when it when it comes to to games like this. And you know, players coming in, the likes of uh, Dixon, uh, Foster, opportunity if they are fit to come in and make an impression. Because obviously, Paul Rowley has the trust in them to put them in the squad. So if they get called upon to play, then they will. Same as uh, Nathan Connell. He's in the squad as well. He spoke about it previously about if the opportunity arises, he will happily give him the opportunity to play. So it'll be interesting to see you know, like you said, with these players that are absent, you know, Ethan Ryan um, coming in to the squad, Nofaluma. So they're going to have to play. If sort of like, let's say, two or three of them are going to have to play to make the, make the full 17. So it'll be interesting to see who Raul, Paul Raleigh puts in. Well, yeah, this is your chance as well, isn't it? So, you know, we said Chris Ankins and Dan Cross are playing well, but <clears throat> unfortunately they pick an injury up, somebody else comes in and then it's up to them to play well to then keep that spot. So, you know, there will be opportunities. You know, Matty Foster, a young player that's come from, from St. Helens, you know, had a bit of an injury, sort of checkered career so far, but he's a relatively young man, young forward. And, you know, if he, he's probably not in that start in 13 so far because he's not really had a sniff yet so far this season. But now he's got a chance, he's in the squad. Um, if he does get his chance, he's going to want to play really, really well and keep that place in the squad. So, um, so yeah, it's competition, isn't it, for players? I mean, that that's what you want. We've just not got a lot of competition because we've got our squad now, and, and those players are going to be playing. So we are we are really short. The worrying thing is, well, you're only four games into a season, and we're already really sort of low on numbers already. So you know, you can imagine when we start getting after Easter time, and you know, it could could uh, could really cut up for us then, but. You cross that bridge when you come to it, don't you? We've just got to, uh, we're just going to keep going and, and, and see what happens. But I'm under no illusion. I think we're going to going to be going to be a tough prospect for us, and uh, it's going to be a tough night. Yeah. So prediction time. What's your thought process on this? Um, I think very very tough game. Um, but I'm not going to back against Salford because I never do. Um, 
I think at home we're, we're, we're a good side at home. We you know we like to entertain, don't we? I'm hoping we're going to get another good crowd because I believe we're going to have sold a few tickets. And our two home crowds up to now have gone up, haven't they? We've got more against OKR. So if we can beat the whole KR one and keep getting a bigger crowd every week, that'll be good. Um, I don't know, score prediction. I fancy we can do it actually, but... <laughs> <laughs> just the way they're playing but yeah, having said that they, they played Penrith and they did not really have an angle from that because they've won the two games after it but perhaps it'll catch up with them you know perhaps they'll rest a few players so let's have a think now I can't see if we can concede in many I said that about St. Helens last week hmm. I've got Salford 18 Wigan 16 18 16 yeah. I'm thinking there's tries in Salford. Rowley Ball will click into another gear at home, confident after beating St. Helens and in our 44 year wait. Like you say, 20 man squad injuries, but that's going to galvanise them even more to, to perform. Um, so I'm going to go Salford 30, Wigan 10. And I'm going to go Lafay. Hat trick. That result will probably take us to. Well, that result will take us top of the league. Mm. We'll be top of the league Thursday night because we joined top anyway, aren't we? On points difference. So, yeah, we'll be top of the league Thursday night and we're whistling on my way back to the car at Brookhouse, uh, yeah. the van at Brookhouse, <laughs> all the way down the uh, A57. So, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, looking forward to that. Yes, yeah. Why not? Why not? So, that's the end of this week's podcast. Um, Big thanks for joining us. Big thanks for all the, the Kofi Reds that, that have donated the coffees uh, to help us buy the programmes. Um, recently invested in a video highlight package, uh, Paul. So we're now we're having a video highlights as well uh, as audio highlights. Our listeners' uh, v- listening figures have jumped 25%. Shows kind of how important social media is and videos to attract listeners new listeners and old listeners to the podcast yeah i think so yeah because some of the stuff i mean I, i'm not as technical as you rob i know you do all that sort of stuff but impresses me when i see stuff like it's very professional i mean you know we're not like the bbc how we've got like millions no. of pounds to throw at stuff but i think we we, we do all right don't we with it so um, yeah it's working out really well and um, we have just got to keep growing it now haven't we and, and see where we can take it but no I think it's great that the listeners have helped us out with the, with the coffee and things like that it just shows I think we've got a very um, very loyal sort of a bunch of listeners haven't we you know people who, who really think a lot of us and we think a lot of them too yeah yeah like I say I can't thank you enough for your support obviously if you want to buy me Paul or Parky a coffee you can do via the, the coffee link on the website uh, but I'm saying we can't thank you enough for, for your support uh, you know we're funding this podcast so Big thanks for joining us on this Devil in the Detail. I'm Rob Parkinson. You can find us on Facebook, Devil in the Detail SRD. You can find us on X at DITD SRD. You can find us on SoundCloud, iTunes and Spotify. Good luck, Reds. We'll see you on the other side. <laughs>